On the morning of April 8, 1942, three American servicemen were on their knees, hands tied behind their backs on Bataan Peninsula. They had been captured the evening before and so donned their first day of captivity as prisoners of Japan. The three men looked upwards at a Japanese officer standing above them. The officer questioned them through an interpreter. What unit are you part of? Where are the rest of the men? The officer asked. 27-year-old Jim Gallagher, a U.S. Army infantry captain with red hair, a diamond-shaped face, a strong chin, and dirt streaks down a newly shaven face, replied, According to the rules of international warfare, I am only required to give my name and rank at this time. The Japanese officer looked at him for a moment, then reached his hand forward and slapped Captain Gallagher across the face, not once, but three times. Gallagher glared at the man in defiance, but spoke no more words. Around 7 a.m., the Japanese guards ordered the three men and the other 15 captured Filipino and American servicemen into two columns, placing Gallagher at the front of one column to set the marching pace. The hungry men had had no food that morning, and possibly none the day before, as they began the day's 10-hour march. It was just the beginning of what would become known as the Bataan Death March. This is Left Behind. Welcome to Left Behind, a podcast about the people left behind when the U.S. surrendered the Philippines in the early days of World War II. I'm Anastasia Harmon, and I tell you the stories of World War II servicemen and women, civilians, guerrillas, and others captured by the Japanese forces in the Philippines. My great-grandfather, Alma Sam, was one of the POWs, and his memoir inspired me to tell stories of his fellow captives. On April 8th or 9th, 1942, a Japanese soldier took a photograph that has become perhaps the most iconic Bataan Surrender Death March photograph. The black and white photo centers on three American soldiers, their hands tied behind their backs, sitting side by side on a bank of dirt with bamboo behind them. In the background are unbound Filipino soldiers whose faces are blurry. On the very right of the image, you can see the legs and torso of a Japanese guard. The guard's left hand rests on a canteen at his waist. I've posted that photograph to the Left Behind Facebook page and Instagram profile so you can get a good look at the photograph there. We see mainly the profiles of these three American soldiers. The one closest to the camera is Samuel Stenzler, a 46-year-old with thinning, balding hair on his crown and a sharp, fairly prominent nose. He sits on the bank, his extended legs sloping down in front of him. He has a bag on his lap that dangles from a string looped around his neck. We see only his profile, but he appears, at least to me, calm and peaceful, almost complacent as he looks toward the Japanese guard. Next to him is Frank Spear. His legs are crossed at the ankles, and he's looking off into the distance toward the background of the photo. 24-year-old Frank has a square jaw that became rounded when his wide smile pushed up his cheeks. But Frank wasn't smiling in this photo. We see only his profile, and he looks agitatedly bored. Next to Spear is Captain Jim Gallagher. Jim's legs are crossed at the knees, and his eyes are looking forward and slightly upwards, seemingly toward the guard's face. Jim's face is streaked with dirt, especially in the nose and mouth area, with a long streak coming from just below his right eye all the way down his cheek. The expression on Jim's face is pure loathing and defiance. This photograph has become one of the most well-known photos of the Bataan Death March and it freezes in time a single moment of the excruciating journey. But what about these men? Who are they, and what happened to them? This is the first of several episodes focusing on the Bataan Death March. Today we'll zoom into the lives of these three men, and I have to tell you, it's kind of a wild ride. So, let's jump in. The photo's three men came from very different backgrounds. Samuel Stenzler was, at age 46, the oldest of the men. He was born in Tulsti, Austria, which may have been part of Poland or the Austria-Hungarian Empire when he was born, 
That area of Europe had so much political upheaval and boundary changes in the late 1800s that it's kind of confusing to nail down the precise country. Today, as far as I'm seeing, Tulsti is part of the Ukraine. But most of the documents about Samuel state he was born in Austria, so that's what we'll go with. Also, his birth date is either September 15th, 1893, or 1895. The year changes depending upon the source. A couple of sources even state 1890 as his birth year. This date shifting isn't uncommon in immigrant records of the late 1800s and early 1900s, as frustrating as it is. Samuel was one of at least four or five children born to Mavel Stenzler. I don't know Samuel's mother's name. The Stenzler family was Jewish, and Jewish immigrants coming from Eastern Europe in the late 1800s and early 1900s are notoriously difficult to research, mainly due to name changes and misspellings of both their personal names and the locations they came from. In fact, I'm quite proud of myself for tracking down Samuel's father's name. It took some digging. 15-year-old Samuel arrived at New York on September 5, 1907, on board the USS President Lincoln with two sisters ages 21 and 18. They had sailed from Hamburg, Germany, and they would have gone through Ellis Island upon arrival at New York. Interestingly, 1907, the year Samuel went through Ellis, was the Immigrant Processing Center's busiest year of traffic with more than one million arrivals. So Samuel was part of that landmark year. I wasn't able to track Samuel Stenzler in New York City once he arrived, but in May 1915, at around age 21, he enlisted in the U.S. Army 17th Cavalry, which was stationed at Fort William McKinley in Manila. He served as Troop M's bugler, earned the rank of corporal, and was honorably discharged in April 1918. After leaving the Army, he settled in San Antonio, Texas. Two years later, he became a U.S. citizen, was working as a clerk, and was not married. By the early 1930s, he had moved to Kilgore, Texas, where he worked as a life insurance salesman and was active in the American Legion. I found his name in several newspaper articles from the 1930s about the American Legion in Kilgore, just his name listed among a long list of other individuals. And unfortunately, that's about all the newspaper coverage I found about Mr. Samuel Stenzler. In February 1940, 22 years after leaving the service, Samuel re-enlisted in the U.S. Army. He was 44 years old and became a private. The 1940 military enlistment record says he was a widower at the time, but I'm not sure whether to believe that because it also said he was 9 feet tall and weighed 900 pounds. He didn't. So I'm not sure if he ever married or had children. I suspect not because there's no hint at marriage in any record except that military enlistment, which is suspect. A month after re-enlisting, Samuel was stationed at Fort MacArthur in San Pedro, California, and sometime after that, he was sent to the Philippines. Frank Spear was the youngest of the group, just days from turning 23 when he was captured on Bataan. Frank's early life is involved. Frank Spear was born Floyd Cantrell Pruitt Jr. in Phoenix, Arizona on April 15, 1919. He was the oldest of two sons born to 28-year-old Floyd Pruitt Sr. and 18-year-old Leola Krebs Pruitt. Sometime in the 1920s, Floyd Sr. and Leola divorced. In April 1930, 11-year-old Floyd Jr., that's our Frank, and his nine-year-old brother Alan lived at the Maud B. Booth Home for Boys and Girls in Los Angeles, California. The Maud B. Booth Home for Boys and Girls was a home for orphans, delinquent children, and those whose parents couldn't afford to keep them at home. So, for example, a mother might place her child in the home so she could work while the father was incarcerated or otherwise absent from the home. I don't know why the Pruitt children were at the home. Their mother, Leola, was living in Los Angeles in the late 1920s. By April 1930, though, when the kids were in the home, Leola was living with her second husband in Phoenix, Arizona. I believe that their father, Floyd Sr., was living in Los Angeles in the 1920s and 30s. By 1937, 
Floyd Jr. was back in Phoenix, where he graduated high school. That July, his mother married her third husband in Denver, Colorado, and I believe both her sons lived with her there. In December 1937, 18-year-old Floyd Jr. was baptized a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Colorado. But by early 1940, Floyd Jr. and his again single mother were lodgers at a home in Kansas City, Missouri. By this time, he was going by the name Frank Spear. And here's how I learned of the name change. Around 11.14 p.m. on February 22, 1940, a motorist spotted the body of a young man on a highway outside of Sedalia, Missouri. He waved down the policeman and, according to a newspaper, reported seeing a man they believed was dead on the slab. The patrolman drove onto the place and found the boy lying on the slab about two feet from the center. They worked with him, found he was breathing, and brought him to the county jail before the night. At some point, the young man became conscious and told them his name was Frank Spear. The police believe he had collapsed on the highway because he was severely weakened by hunger. When questioned by police the next day, Frank told them that his real name was Floyd Cantrell Pruitt, but that his father was dead and his stepfather, who lives in Ajo, Arizona, is named Spear. Now, just a quick fact check here. Frank's birth father, Floyd C. Pruitt Sr., was alive at this time, and he lived in Ajo, Arizona with his second wife and Frank's mother was single in 1940, so he didn't have a legal stepfather at the time. And I haven't found any record that Floyd Jr. slash Frank ever had a stepfather with the last name Spear. So I'm not certain where the last name Spear came from, or the first name Frank for that matter. At some point though, Lloyd Pruitt Jr. began going by Frank Spear. It was a lot easier to change your name back then, not much, if any, paperwork required. And how thankful am I for this random newspaper article, without which I wouldn't have been able to link Frank Spear with Floyd Pruitt. Because around 1940, records for Lloyd stop, and records for Frank begin. And there's no other documentation that really links the two men. Also, I'm fascinated by Frank's mother's story. She had four husbands from what I found, and seems to have worked menial jobs to keep her sons with her. I don't know her whole story, but her life must have been difficult, as was Frank's. Well, Frank further told the officers that He was on his way home, he said, from New York, to which place he had hitchhiked to have an audition in Major Bo's studio. He was given the audition, he said, remained in New York just four hours, and started back to Kansas City, and was hitchhiking his way home when he collapsed. The youth said he had been selected as one of the 25 best singers in high school, having a high tenor voice. When in New York, he said he was told that he would receive a letter in about a week from the Major Bose studio, and that he would be given a place on his program, possibly not for a month or six weeks, as their programs are planned so far ahead. The Missouri officers then fingerprinted and released Frank. His home in Kansas City was 90 miles or 145 kilometers from Sedalia, where he had passed out. So I think releasing him was an interesting move. I mean, he'd passed out in the street the night before due to hunger from walking and hitchhiking. So maybe they could have helped him get home some way? And honestly, I'm not quite certain what to make of this story. It seems so strange to hitchhike to New York, stay four hours, and then hitchhike back home to Missouri. By the way, Major Bose was a radio personality who hosted the Major Bose Amateur Hour, a popular amateur talent show on the radio. Eight months later, Frank was living in Hooper, Utah, working for the Civilian Conservation Corps, or CCC. The CCC workers at this camp worked at the Ogden Bay Refuge, which today is called the Ogden Bay Waterfowl Management Area. On August 13, 1941, while still in Utah, Frank enlisted in the U.S. Army and was assigned to the ominous sounding Chemical Warfare Service. He received 60 days of military training and, in October 1941, sailed to the Philippines. Failing to Manila at approximately the same time was 27-year-old Jim Gallagher. James McDonald Gallagher was born in Philadelphia on October 18, 1914, to Joseph and Catherine Gallagher, 
He was the youngest of at least six siblings, and the Gallagher family, unsurprisingly, were Irish and Catholic. Jim grew up in the family's stately, multi-story brick home in Philadelphia. I don't know the wards or neighborhoods of Philadelphia at all, but I located the home using Google Maps Street View, and it seems to be in an area of the city that looks almost suburban, with detached homes and yards that go all the way around the houses. Father Joseph worked as a cigar manufacturer, as an advertising agency solicitor, and then as a postmaster. And he must have done very well because the family home was worth $50,000 in 1930, which was an expensive home for the time. And they also had live-in servants. While growing up, young Jim had been passionately devoted to athletics, both as a participant and as a spectator. Anything in the field of competition aroused his deepest interest. I believe Jim's father wrote that statement, although the source isn't clear exactly who the writer was. That interest in sports would form Jim's career after he graduated from Georgetown in 1936, at which time he was also commissioned as a second lieutenant in the U.S. Army Infantry Reserve. The newly graduated 21-year-old returned to Philadelphia and started working for the Philadelphia Record, which was, at the time, one of Philly's leading newspapers. At first, Jim solicited classified ads. Then he became a cub reporter working on the police, courts, and federal activities beat. But eventually, he got the position he really wanted. He became a sports reporter. During this time, according to a newspaper, Jim, wrote a series of articles for the record called Dinny the Dub, which described the frustration of an ardent duffer in such widely separated endeavors as playing goalie on a ladies' field hockey team to fighting a leading light heavyweight contender. A couple of 1940s slang translations here. A dub is a fool, and a duffer is an incompetent or stupid person, someone who is inexperienced at something, especially at playing golf. Jim would try a variety of sports in his guise as Dinny the Dub, then write humorous articles about the experience. Whether Jim really was unfamiliar with the various sports he tried or was just pretending, I'm not sure. And in fact, for someone who wrote newspaper articles for a living, I have found surprisingly few newspaper articles about Jim. I really wanted to find and share an article written by him. But the Philadelphia Record newspaper doesn't seem to be digitized, and beyond that, I can't even locate where the archived copies are housed today. So, in a podcast episode that will use many newspaper article quotes, I haven't found a single article written by the sports reporter, and I think that's what we call ironic, don't you think? But Jim doesn't seem to have been just a farce writer. Jim's great desire and earnest aim was to be a serious writer. He devoted a portion of every day training for this goal. This was his life when in October 1940, he was called to active service. Again, I don't know for certain, but I think Jim's father wrote that. The next year, Jim was in training at Fort Bragg in North Carolina and possibly in South Carolina. In fall of 1941, he visited the Philadelphia Records office. A newspaper article described the visit. It came as a great surprise to learn that Jim was a reserve officer, United States Army. He came into the office one day in October 1941 in uniform. The first lieutenant's bars were on his shoulders. He looked like a soldier. He was a soldier. One of the younger reporters said, Gee, when I'm drafted, I'd like to be in Jim's platoon. Just a quick note, I will quote from a few Philadelphia Record newspaper articles, despite what I said above about not being able to find archives for the record. These articles were clippings I found in a book of Jim's letters that his family published. Just wanted to clarify that. Well, shortly after that visit to his former employer, Jim was off to the Philippines, stopping in Hawaii and Guam along the way. He arrived in Manila on November 20th, 1941. For the first week or so, he and his unit didn't have a specific assignment, so he enjoyed sightseeing in Manila and buying and shipping Christmas presents for his family. He described the gifts in detail in a letter home to his father. By November 30th, he was assigned to the Philippine Army's Northern Luzon Force. He wrote to his father, As I mentioned before, we are to be instructors in the Native Army and will have direct command. Our job is to check on the Philippine officers 
most of whom are inexperienced. The Philippine Army was the Philippines' national army. It was separate from the U.S. Army until summer 1941, when President Roosevelt, anticipating a threat from Japan, placed most of the Philippine Army under the umbrella of the U.S. forces in the Far East. That's an official name, or USAFFE for short. Now don't confuse the Philippine Army with the Philippine Scouts, which I focused on in several episodes. The Scout units were U.S. Army units and they had been around since the early 1900s. They were highly trained and expert soldiers. The Philippine Army was established in 1936, so it was still relatively new when Lieutenant Jim Gallagher was assigned to it. And, as I understand it, many of the Filipino men serving in the Philippine Army in late 1941 were reservists. The servicemen in the Philippine Army, especially in the reserves, were, unfortunately, often undertrained and armed with subpar equipment. For example, at least some units fought with outdated World War I era rifles. Thus, when Lieutenant Jim Gallagher arrived in Manila in November 1941, it was apparent that the Philippine Army leadership needed some training. So Jim and others were ordered north to join the Philippine Army forces in northern Luzon. Specifically, he was assigned to the 33rd Infantry Regiment, 31st Infantry Division, which was a reserve unit that had been called into active duty. But as it turns out, there wouldn't be much time for training as Japanese forces attacked the Philippines on December 8, 1941. So just days after Lieutenant Gallagher had received orders to go train their leaders. I believe Gallagher would have been stationed near Baguio at the start of the war. Also stationed near Baguio at the outbreak of war was Austrian native Samuel Stenzler he was part of the U.S. Infantry Regiment on Luzon Island, which is the Philippines' main island. Private Frank Spear, the youngest of the three men, was part of the 4th Chemical Company, which was part of the Far East Air Force. I'm not certain where Spear was stationed when the war started, and I don't know what his unit did as part of the Chemical Warfare Services for the Air Corps. I can't find any information about his unit at all. When the Far East Air Force was all but decimated during the first few weeks of war, most FEAF servicemen joined the American infantry units on Bataan. So, although I don't have specific information about Private Spear, I believe he joined the infantry fighting forces on Bataan Peninsula. But, regardless of where they spent their first few weeks of war, by early January 1942, all three men had withdrawn to the Bataan Peninsula with their assigned units. While on Bataan, Lieutenant Jim Gallagher, the sports reporter, wrote several letters to his father. On February 16th, he told his father, All in all, we are not badly off. I am acting as executive, or second in command of the unit. Our boys are green, but some do exceedingly well. Jim's letter dated February 24th said, Boy, my voice has grown very loud, and I'm almost explicit. In short, I'm a very rough guy to deal with right now. I even look rugged. I have, believe it or not, a flowing very red beard and practically no hair. My razor blades have given out, but we have a barber. Big news, big news! You now have in your family a full-fledged United States Army Infantry Captain. The promotion came through effective the 20th. We have had a lot of very pretty rumors lately, but have our fingers well crossed that they are untrue. You hear the most fantastic stuff, most of which falls flat. We are anxiously waiting to hear what Roosevelt has to say today. It will be a few days before we do so. I hope it is plenty juicy. Here vague reports that this particular bit of jungle, called Bataan, has become somewhat famous back in the US. It sure seems funny to us here. We are a most disreputable and unwashed looking crew, who are most hungrily looking forward to the first meal we will have in Manila, God willing. He then goes on to describe, in detail, the milkshakes, steaks, and other food he's dreaming of. From many of the first-hand baton accounts I've read, the servicemen and women there often fantasized about food. And did you notice Jim mentioning, quote, we are all anxiously waiting to hear what Roosevelt has to say today, close quote? That was referencing the anticipated fireside chat the president was going to give about the war. Here's what Jim Gallagher, Samuel Stenzer, Frank Spear, and the other nearly 80,000 men fighting on Bataan heard. Immediately after this war started, Japanese forces moved down on either side of the Philippines 
to numerous points south of them, thereby completely encircling the Philippines from north and south and east and west. It is that complete encirclement with control of the air by Japanese land-based aircraft which has prevented us from sending substantial reinforcements of men and material to the gallant defenders of the Philippines. For 40 years, it has always been our strategy, a strategy born of necessity, that in the event of a full-scale attack on the islands by Japan, we should fight a delaying action, attempting to retire slowly into Batan Peninsula and Corregidor. We knew that the war as a whole would have to be fought and won by a process of attrition against Japan itself. We knew all along that with our greater resources, we could ultimately outbuild Japan and overwhelm her on sea and on land and in the air. We knew that to obtain our objective, many varieties of operations would be necessary in areas other than the Philippines. <coughs> now, nothing that has occurred in the past two months has caused us to revise this basic strategy of necessity, except that the defense put up by General MacArthur has magnificently exceeded the previous estimates of endurance, and he and his men are gaining eternal glory therefore. Soon thereafter, Jim wrote another letter to his father. I meant to mention it before, but just wanted to tell you that I took out a $10,000 life insurance policy in your favor the other day. You probably read about the Jap shelling of the California refinery. As the story goes, General MacArthur has sent a cable to the commanding general of the core area, of which California is part. The cable said, hold out for 90 days and we'll get aid to you. They tell of capturing a Jap lieutenant with a diary on his person. He said, among other things, that he had fought two years in China, but never experienced anything like the hell the American artillery gave him. Amid their increasing hunger and sickness and the decreasing morale on Bataan, the American and Filipino servicemen, as Jim points out, had a few laughs and high moments, but all in all, the situation on Bataan was dire. On April 3rd, 1942, Japanese forces mounted a huge assault on the Bataan front lines near the U.S. stronghold of Mount Samat. All three men fought with their units in this area. As the U.S. lines crumbled, American and Filipino servicemen near the front lines began retreating southward. Bataan surrendered six days after the initial assault on April 9, 1942. And this is where the iconic photograph comes in. This photo was taken on April 8th or 9th, 1942. Sources, even the ones that should be most factually correct and official, say it was taken on April 9th. However, first-hand accounts of the surrender state that these three men were POWs on April 8th, a full day before Bataan officially surrendered on April 9th. Thus, the photo could have been taken on April 8th. A sergeant named Emanuel Homberger later wrote, I first encountered Captain Gallagher early in the morning of April 8, 1942. He evidently was captured the evening before. He and two others, Frank Spear and Sam Stensler, were being questioned by a Japanese officer through an interpreter. The whole time, the three were on their knees and all looked pretty woozy. During the questioning, I overheard Gallagher tell the Japs that according to the rules of international warfare, he was only required to give his name and rank at this time. He was slapped in the face by the Jap officer about three times. In this area, there were about six of us Americans and about 12 Filipino soldiers who had been captured in the Mount Samut area on the front line. Based on this first-hand account, it seems that Gallagher, Stenzler, and Spear were captured on the evening of April 7, 1942, near the disintegrated front line. Also, don't you just love Jim Gallagher's defiance? I don't have to tell you more than my name and rank. Of course, the consequence of that defiance was just the beginning of the tortures awaiting the captured men. I don't know if the questioning Homburger describes here was when the iconic photo was taken. In another account, Homburger describes seeing the three men on their knees because they were talking to a Japanese officer who was sitting on a bank of dirt. By kneeling, the three men were eye level with that officer. That interaction happened on the early morning of April 8th. 
The picture, however, Spears, Stenzler, and Gallagher are the ones sitting on a bank with their hands tied behind their backs and looking up at a Japanese soldier slash guard. So maybe the photo was taken at a completely different time and place. Or perhaps the scene Homburger described is when the picture was taken and the specific details of Homburger's memory are slightly off. I haven't been able to determine this question for certain. Well, Humberger gives the best account of what comes next, so I'll leave that to him. Around 7 a.m. on April 8, we were lined up prepared to march. Captain Gallagher and I were placed in front of the column to set the pace. We marched all day until about 5 p.m. We were placed under a large mango tree and the Japs gave us some hot tea and a small sack of cakes for each two men. Captain Gallagher and I split one bag, which had 34 small cakes. He insisted I take them all as he didn't care to eat. He's pretty much weakened after the day's march without food, most likely not having any food the previous day. While we were sitting there, he went out of his head for a few seconds. I asked him what was the matter and he replied, I wish I knew. From all appearances, he was full of malaria. At the start of the march, Jim appeared as normal as any of us. We were all somewhat weakened and hungry. He didn't mention anything about feeling badly and seemed okay until the end of the march that evening. After we had rested around an hour, we were placed on trucks and were taken to Belanga, capital of Bataan. We were locked up in the basement of a large dwelling and kept there all night. There were about a hundred Filipinos and one more American there when we arrived. During that evening and early the next morning, Captain Gallagher passed out several times. I had some aromatic spirits of ammonia which I held under his nose which seemed to revive him. We had a few quinine tablets, which he also took. The next morning, April 9, the Japs fed us some rice and canned fish, but Gallagher wouldn't eat. He appeared to be too exhausted. After breakfast, we loaded on trucks and left for Orani. Captain Gallagher had to be lifted on the truck. We detrucked at Orani and were taken in a building, formerly a public market, and were required to fill out some blank forms. During that period, around an hour, Jim was lying on his back and seemed to be asleep. Frank Spear was trying to take care of him. When we were ordered back on the trucks, Gallagher couldn't get up, so Frank Spear picked him up with a fireman's carry and started for the truck. At this time, the Japs ordered Spear to take him across the road and into a small shack. Spear came back just before the trucks pulled out, about ten minutes. He sat down beside me and told me that Captain Gallagher died in that shack and that he searched him and took his billfold and identification tags. I told Spear he should leave one of the tags on him so he could be identified later, but just then the trucks pulled out and it was too late. Spear later told me he turned in the tags and the billfold to an army chaplain, but I don't know his name. When I last saw him on Spear's back, I noticed his face was real purple and remarked that he needed medical attention, but under the conditions, none was available. In my opinion, Captain Gallagher's death was due to malaria, malnutrition, and exhaustion. He died about 12 noon, April 9, 1942. Jim Gallagher was 27 years old. He died mere hours after that iconic photo was taken. You may have noticed Homburger mentioned that Private Frank Spear returned with Gallagher's billfold and dog tax. Keep that in mind, we'll come back to those items later. Two days after his death, which no one in the United States knew about yet, Jim's former employer, the Philadelphia Record, ran this story. A couple of desks away from where these lines are being written, Jim Gallagher once pounded away at a typewriter. Jim is a slender, blue-eyed kid, and he's so far away, and we are all so helpless. He was one of the gang. He was one of us, Jim Gallagher was. Jim is over there, somewhere in what is left of the torment that for 96 days made a hell of a peaceful jungle. There is no denying the fact that the Battle of Bataan was a physical defeat. Yet, it cannot be that the spirit of the men who fought for that little strip of land ever will be defeated. As long as there is a baton, it will be there. And someday, it will rise again, and the stars and stripes will proclaim anew that for which our buddy Jim Gallagher and his brothers in arms fought. Over the next three years, the Japanese would definitely try their best to defeat the spirit of the men captured on baton. The truck carrying Privates Stenzler and Spear left Orani, which was about 15 miles or 28 kilometers north of where the three men were captured. I don't know where that truck took them, and I don't know if they had to do more marching. The traditional Bataan Death March route is along the eastern coastal road of Bataan, northward to the city of San Fernando, 
where they were then trained north to Camp O'Donnell. The POWs captured at the very southern point of Bataan had to march 65 miles or 106 kilometers to get to San Fernando. But when Privates Frank Spear and Samuel Stenzer left Irani on that truck right after Gallagher had died, they were only 25 miles or 41 kilometers from San Fernando. So if Stenzler and Spear did have to march part of that, their march was much shorter than most Bataan Death March survivors. Also, you might be wondering why they rode in trucks at all. Well, the death march didn't officially begin until April 10th, the day after surrender. While Gallagher, Spear, and Stenzler were riding towards Irani on the morning of April 9th, Major General Ed King was surrendering to Japanese forces. So, my best guess is that on the morning of April 9th, the Japanese leaders hadn't decided to have the POWs march to San Fernando. In that sense, I suppose, Speer and Stenzler were lucky. But regardless of whether they marched or were trucked, the two men were sent to Camp O'Donnell. I'll cover this camp in detail in a few weeks, but conditions here were inhumane. The men were sick and became more so as the torturous weeks there went on. Malaria and dysentery ran rampant. Dysentery is a gastrointestinal disease that causes severe bloody diarrhea. Patients get stomach cramps, bloating, fever, nausea, fatigue, and painful defecation. Left untreated, it causes severe dehydration, which leads to death. Death rates at Camp O'Donnell due to dysentery were astronomically high. And among those victims was 46-year-old Private Samuel Stenzler. He passed away from dysentery on May 26, 1942, about seven weeks after Bataan's surrender. He was buried in the Camp O'Donnell Cemetery, Plot J, Row 2, Grave 6. In early June of 42, the remaining American POWs at O'Donnell, Private Frank Spear included, were sent to the Cabanatuan POW camps. Spear remained at Cabanatuan for nearly one and a half years. And during that time, he swore to an American officer, who was also a POW, that he saw the dead body of James Gallagher, Captain Infantry, who died at about 3 p.m. on April 9, 1942, near Orani, Philippine Islands. This affidavit is dated September 16, 1943, and included Frank's signature at the bottom. The American officers at Cabanatuan had the foresight to keep such records of POW deaths. And without such records, we may not have details on the deaths of men who died during the Bataan Death March. Shortly after giving this statement, Private Frank Spear and 350 other men were transferred to Japan on board the hellship Koho Maru. Hellships were so named because of their hellish conditions. He arrived at Camp Nagata No. 5 on October 7, 1943. This camp was located near the city of Nagata, on Japan's main island's western coast, and about 200 miles or 320 kilometers north of Tokyo. The prisoners of this camp worked as laborers at the Niigata port and at a foundry. After a year and nine months at the camp, Spear attempted to escape from camp in July 1945. I'm not sure how successful the attempt was, as in I don't know how far of camp he actually got, but he was recaptured. At first, he was confined to the camp's penitentiary. Then, on July 19, 1945, Private Frank Spear was personally executed by the camp's commandant, Lieutenant Tetsutaro Kato. One source about Niigata Camp's deceased POWs state that Frank Spear was, quote, beaten to death for walking out of gate in a delirious state of mind, close quote. In November 1945, Spears' hometown newspaper reported. According to information given by a fellow prisoner at Niigata when Private Spear was there, Private Spear was taken with a group of other prisoners from the camp and shot. Still, other sources state that Kato killed Spear with a bayonet. Now, all of these sources are secondary sources, meaning derived from other people's diaries and spoken words. So, I don't know which is correct. The bayonetting form of death was the most widely reported in the U.S. newspapers. But, despite all that, Spears' official U.S. military report of death states that he died of, quote, stricture of the heart, close quote. 
that diagnosis, at least as far as I can find on the interwebs, doesn't seem to be an actual diagnosis. The word stricture means constriction, so I guess that would translate to death by constriction of the heart. However, I suspect this official death information was provided to the U.S. military or the Red Cross by the Japanese government, which would not have put bayoneted by Camp Commandant Kato as the cause of death. Remember, the Japanese were trying to keep up appearances that they were treating the POWs well. Frank's body was cremated and his remains were put in a marked box. He was 26 years old. Six weeks later, on September 5, 1945, the Niigata camp was liberated by American forces. If only Frank Spear could have withstood captivity for just a bit longer. After the war, his remains were returned to U.S. control, and today, he's interred at the Manila American Cemetery in the Philippines. Despite Private Frank Spears' official report of death, it obviously came out after liberation that he was killed by the camp commandant, Lieutenant Tetsutaro Kato. After the war, the U.S. interviewed former POWs to ascertain information about war crimes, and my suspicion is that the true information about Spears' death came out then. The U.S. arrested and held war crimes trials against individual Japanese leaders. One of the named leaders was Lieutenant Kato, specifically for the death of Spear. A newspaper reported that, Spears was bayoneted after his escape from a Niigata prison camp and his recapture. Kato is also accused of beating and kicking five other allied internees, one of whom lost an eye. But Kato apparently became a fugitive. A December 1948 newspaper article reported he was recently nabbed by the Japanese police after a three-year hunt. And shortly after that, U.S. newspapers reported that Kato was charged with ordering and participating in the bayoneting of Private Frank Spear, 26, of Kansas City, Missouri, in July 1945. Kato pled not guilty to the charges, but in early 1949, he was found guilty and sentenced to execution. However, five months later, General Douglas MacArthur set aside the death sentence imposed on Lieutenant Tetsutaru Kato and ordered the case retried with the explanation that the military commission which tried Kato had admitted prejudicial evidence without informing the defendant. In June 1949, Kato's second trial began in Yokohama, Japan. He was again found guilty of fatally bayoneting Frank Spear and sentenced to life imprisonment. But, a couple months later, that sentence was reduced to 30 years because Kato tried to improve conditions at their camp. Affidavits from American prisoners say Kato acted beyond what his superior officers deemed necessary to assist the prisoners. Kato was released just a few years later in 1952. He wrote a book about his wartime experiences, which is called, in English, I Want to Be a Shellfish. It has since been made into two movies. While the American and Japanese authorities were hunting for Kato, sports writer Jim Gallagher's father, Joseph, was on a hunt of his own for information about his son. In April and May 1942, so mere weeks after the surrender of Bataan, Joseph wrote to the War Department seeking information about Jim. The War Department responded that they didn't yet know the status of any individual servicemen from Bataan. Information about everyone who had served on Bataan was slow in coming. The main reason was that the U.S. officials had to rely on information from enemy sources. And if the enemy didn't provide that information, U.S. officials wouldn't know specific servicemen's fates. Most POW's families found out their loved one's status in late 1942 and early 1943, after the Red Cross received information from Japanese sources. Unfortunately, Joseph Gallagher never received official word of his son's status. Instead, those letters that Jim had written his father on baton finally arrived at the Gallagher home. As he read them, Joseph had no idea his son was already dead. Between the fall of Bataan and the war's end, Joseph Gallagher continued to write letters to anyone who might have information about the status of his son. In early 1943, he attempted to get information directly from General MacArthur. One of the general's secretaries responded, General MacArthur has asked me to answer your letter of inquiry concerning your son, Captain James M. Gallagher, 
I regret to inform you that there is no information concerning him at this headquarters, and the General does not recall any contact with him. In response to a June 1944 letter, the War Department stated, It is regretted exceedingly that up to the present time no further report concerning Captain Gallagher has reached the War Department. And then, about a year later, on May 26, 1945, more than three years after his son's death, and as the war was coming to an end, Joseph Gallagher received a telegram from the War Department. I am deeply distressed to inform you, corrected report just received, states your son, Captain James McD. Gallagher, who was previously reported missing in action, was killed in action on the 9th of April, 1942, on Philippine Islands, period. The Secretary of War asked that I express his deep sympathy in your loss and his regret that unavoidable circumstances made necessary the unusual lapse of time in reporting your son's death to you. Confirmation letter follows. In January 1945, the Cabana Tuan POW camp was liberated, and with that, U.S. officials got access to Frank Spears' affidavit regarding Captain Jim Gallagher's death. Thus, that document became the official record of Gallagher's death. Not long after word of Jim's death reached his family, Jim's former employer, the Philadelphia Record, wrote, We of the Record can never forget young Jim. To his father, Postmaster Joseph F. Gallagher, we can offer a sympathy that at least has an understanding of the fine qualities and the greatness of his son. It is from the lives of so many young Jims that victory for America has been achieved. But the news of his son's death didn't end Joseph Gallagher's search. You'll recall Sergeant Homberger's account of Jim's death from earlier in this episode. That account was in a letter written to Jim's father. The account states that Jim's body was left in a shed near the Bataan town of Irani, and that Spear handed over Jim's billfold and dog tags to a chaplain. Armed with that information, Joseph mounted a four-year campaign to identify his son's remains, as well as to obtain that billfold. He wrote letter after letter to anyone who might be able to help him. The quartermaster general's office, his U.S. senator, the mayor of Irani, where Jim died, and even the Catholic Archbishop of Manila. Joseph's U.S. senator sent multiple letters to various other military and War Department sources. Joseph's letters, both those before and after the war, show an anguished parent searching for any information about his son. And it's heartbreaking to read through the letters, especially when they're presented one right after the other, just begging for anyone to help find his son. It's truly tragic. The Quartermaster General's office, that's the military office at the time charged with identification of soldiers' remains, as well as soldiers' personal items, does seem to have attempted to locate Jim's remains and his belongings. But they never could. And honestly, both requests were probably impossible. Regarding the billfold, Japanese soldiers stole anything of value from American and Filipino prisoners after surrender. Odds are the billfold was taken from the American chaplain by a Japanese soldier, and there's absolutely no documentation of what would have happened to it after that. Regarding Jim's remains, Jim died on that chaotic day of surrender and Spear had taken the dog tags rather than leave them with Gallagher's body. So it was anyone's guess what happened to the body of a deceased American POW with no identification. After the war, some human remains believed to be American servicemen were exhumed in Irani. That's the burial where Jim died. But none of these remains matched Jim's dental and other identifiers. In 1948, a farmer near Orani was excavating an avocado tree and found human remains. The U.S. Army dug around the area and found the bones, which were in very bad shape, described as rotting because the avocado tree's roots had grown into them, and the remains seemed to have been unusable for identification. If only Spear had left one of the dog tags with Gallagher's body. In 1949, seven years after his death, Jim Gallagher's remains were declared non-recoverable, which remains his status to this day. The Quartermaster General's office, however, was able to locate and identify the remains of Austrian native Samuel Stenzler. You'll recall that he was buried at Camp O'Donnell, 
And thanks to meticulous record keeping by Americans at the camp, his grave was easily located after the war. Then dental records further confirmed the identity of Samuel's remains. The quartermaster general's office, however, had to spend time identifying Samuel's next of kin. At first, a cousin of Samuel's, who lived in Dallas, Texas, attempted to collect Samuel's remains for reburial in the United States. There was quite a bit of back and forth between the cousin's attorneys and the quartermaster general's office to obtain information about all of Samuel's living blood relatives. That information was needed in order to determine exactly who was the next of kin, and thus had rights to his remains and possessions, and probably his back pay and insurance money. As an FYI, rights to remains went in this order. 1. Surviving widow. 2. Sons over 21, in order of seniority. 3. Daughters over 21, in order of seniority. 4. Father. 5. Mother. 6. Brothers over 21, in order of seniority. 7. Sisters over 21, in order of seniority. And finally, extended family. Well, after several letters back and forth, the quartermaster general learned that Samuel had a sister in Texas, a brother in New York City, another sister in Romania, and another brother in Brazil. Eventually, they determined that Sol Stenzler of New York City was Samuel's eldest living brother. Thus, Sol had rights to determine where Samuel's remains would rest, and he chose Long Island. Thus, on October 18, 1949, Private Samuel Stenzler's remains were interred at Long Island National Cemetery on Long Island, New York, Section 8, Site 9577. So, that's the story, as far as I've found, behind the iconic Bataan surrender photo. None of the men survived the war, and that feels especially tragic because of how well known the photo has become. But Speer, Stenzler, and Gallagher were just three of some 70,000 American and Filipino servicemen captured on Bataan, and who would endure the Bataan death march. More on that next time. This is Left Behind. Thank you for listening. You can find pictures, maps, and sources about Samuel Stenzler, Jim Gallagher, and Frank Spear on the Left Behind website and Facebook page, as well as on Instagram at Left Behind Podcast. You'll find the links in the show description. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with a friend. Word of mouth is the best way people learn about podcasts. Left Behind is researched, written, and produced by me, Anastasia Harmon. Voiceovers by Jake Herrenberg, Paul Sutherland, Tyler Harmon, and Mike Davis. Dramatizations are based on historical research, although some creative liberty is taken with dialogue. And I'll be back next time with two brothers who served together on Bataan and together shared the same post-surrender fate.